to Buffy and the Art of Story Season 4. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you are in the right place. Today we are talking about Season 4, Episode 7, The Initiative, where we finally find out what those military guys are doing. I am Lisa M. Lilly, novelist and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. If you like supernatural thrillers or amateur sleuth mysteries, you may want to check out my first in series free ebooks at Lisa Lilly, that's L I W L L Y dot com slash free. As to the initiative, we'll talk today about whether this episode is less a story and more a handful of subplots in search of a plot, serious questions about who is the protagonist, a genre mix of rom-com and secret agent man, and many seeds for the rest of season four. There will be no spoilers unless it's to talk about foreshadowing at the very end of the episode with plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. The initiative aired the first time on November 16, 1999. It was written by Douglas Petrie and directed by James A. Contner. The DVD edition contains commentary from Doug Petrie. Most of that I will cover at the end. We start with conflict in the cafeteria. This is our opening conflict meant to draw the viewer or reader in, and sometimes that early conflict relates to the main plot or a subplot. First, we have a scene that does relate to one of the plot lines here. Riley and his friend Forrest are sitting in the cafeteria while Forrest looks at all the pretty young women because they need hotties to come to their party. Riley, though, is buried in papers he has to grade by 3 p.m. So right away, there is this minor conflict between the two of them. And Forrest says, how are you going to learn anything if you keep doing schoolwork? And he goes on and points to the cafeteria line. Check her out. Is she hot or is she hot? Riley glances over and says, she's Buffy. Forrest says, Buffy, I like that. That girl's so hot, she's Buffy. Riley says, it's her name, Forrest. Forrest is impressed that Riley knows Buffy, but Riley claims he never really thinks about her and then says she's all right, but she's kind of peculiar. Another friend, Graham, joins Forrest and Riley, and Forrest gets his agreement that Buffy is mattressable. As the guys talk, Buffy is struggling with the frozen yogurt machine, which breaks when she tries to shut it off. It keeps swirling out yogurt and she moves on. Later on, she'll trip. I'm not sure why exactly we have this. In some ways, it's relatable. We've all had that fear that right as people are noticing us, we're doing something awkward. And especially if someone is looking at us whom we might become interested in or be attracted to. Buffy, of course, still looks amazing. And her struggles with the machine and tripping doesn't seem to affect the guys watching at all. Riley claims he doesn't dislike Buffy, but she never feels like she's really there when you talk to her. Forrest says, hell yes, he'd go out with her, and he bets a lot of guys would like to get their hands on her. We're at two minutes, seven seconds in, and we switch scenes and cut to Spike. This next scene is from Spike's point of view. The previous one was from Riley's point of view. And I'm mentioning that because a ways through the episode, I struggled with who the protagonist was. And I went back and made a note of whose point of view we were in for each of these scenes in the first part of the episode. Spike is looking more pale than usual, and he's lying on a white tile floor, semi-conscious and whispering about killing the Slayer. So nice connection to lots of guys would want to get their hands on her. He opens his eyes, sits, sees he is in a cage with what looks like a glass wall on one side, probably not glass because that would be too easy to break. He puts his hands on it and electricity 
somebody shoots through it and he jumps back. The camera pans back and we see rows of these cages, people in white coats going by, and other vampires and creatures in the cages. So we have conflict in both of these two scenes, and I struggle throughout with which of the plots that these relate to, which one is the subplot, and which one is the main plot. But this is a scene that pays off last week where we saw Spike electrocuted and dragged away. At 2 minutes 58 seconds, we cut to the credits. When we come back, we are in Giles' point of view at his apartment. He is drawing a guy in military gear with a mask on because everyone in Buffy seems to be able to draw very well. And he seems disappointed that the guy clearly appears to be human. He shuts his book and says, once again, I'd say you and I will not be needed to help Buffy. He's talking to Xander. Xander suggests they pull out a Ouija board, summon some unstoppable evil, and then they can kick its ass. This is a nice minor conflict here. We are nearing 10% through the episode at 4 minutes 49 seconds when Buffy enters the apartment. Normally here, I would expect to see the story spark or inciting incident of the episode, and it gets our main plot rolling, I do not see one here. Instead, we have uh, sort of a continuation. Buffy looks at the drawing and says it is her late night stormtrooper pal and goes on to say, that's your man. And Giles says, your man, actually. And he thinks she ought to focus tonight on finding one of these military guys. But Buffy argues she needs to act like a normal student in the dorm and Willow needs a break, so she is taking Willow to a party. When talking about Willow, Buffy refers to the black hole of despair that Willow's been in since Oz left. So again, we get a tiny bit of backstory through conflict. She tells Xander and Giles to patrol that night instead of her. I love that we have character growth, a lot of it, for both Buffy and Giles since Reptile Boy, the last time that Buffy skipped patrolling to go to a frat party, there she lied to Giles, and Giles had been pushing her so hard, and they both agreed to change their ways in the future. We're at 5 minutes 46 seconds in. We switch back to Spike's point of view. He paces in the cage. A buzzer sounds. A packet of blood drops from the ceiling, but a voice from the cage next to him tells Spike, don't drink it, it's drugged. We see that the voice comes from another vampire who calls himself a lab rat. He says, they'll starve you, then shoot out a packet, you drink it, and the next thing you know, you're gone. And that's when they do their experiments. One quick thing from the Doug Petrie commentary, this vampire was part of Sunday's gang in the first episode. And I like that they use this character. It could have been anybody, but they got this same vampire. Spike asks who they are, government, Nazis, a major cosmetics company, but all the vampire knows is one minute he was running from the Slayer and the next he was here. Spike says, the Slayer, I knew it, I knew it. And he rants a bit and says one of my favorite lines, I always worried what would happen when that bitch got some funding. So very Spike, I feel like only he would lie awake thinking about that. He says he'll take Buffy apart. I don't care how brilliant she is. And we cut to Buffy in class struggling with a pen that leaked. And Willow says ballpoints can be tricky. After class, Willow tells Riley that he left someone off the roll call. Daniel Osborne. Oz. I am pretty sure this is the first time we get Oz's full name. But Riley tells her Oz is no longer in the class, that he heard Oz dropped out. Willow says, no, Oz will be back. And Professor Walsh says he won't be back to her class. And she goes on, an educated guess. You know the rules. You know I hate exceptions. Yet somehow you feel your exception is exceptional. 
I really like that word usage here with exception and exceptional. And she goes on, since I'm neither a freshman nor a narcissist, I have to consider the whole class. If your friend can't respect my schedule, I think it's best he not come back. I feel like it's always a bad sign if you have to tell people you're not a narcissist. Willow is distraught and she leaves and Buffy says to Professor Walsh, you know, for someone who teaches human behavior, you might try showing some. Walsh says it's not her job to coddle her students. And Buffy says, you're right, a human being in pain has nothing to do with your job. And she leaves. Now we switch briefly to Riley's point of view. Professor Walsh says to him, I like her. Riley says, really? You don't think she's a little peculiar? Next, we are in Xander's basement, and he takes out some weapons. Giles is impressed by how many he has, and Xander says he requisitioned them back when he was military guy. And Giles says that was two years ago. Are his skills still 100%? This is a reference to Halloween when Xander turned into a soldier. Xander at first claims yes, but he struggles to even load a gun and finally admits he doesn't have the technical skills to join the Swiss Army, and all those guys ask you to do is uncork a couple of sassy Cabernets. He's ready for hand-to-hand combat, though, but before he can say much about that, his mom calls down from upstairs. She made a nice fruit punch for him and his friend. Would you boys like some? Giles says, is it, um, raspberry fruit punch? So this is a lovely little character moment speaking to where Giles is hanging out with a friend in the basement like a teenager, and it shows Xander's continuing struggles to find his footing this year. At 10 minutes 23 seconds in, we cut to Riley's point of view. He's throwing a frisbee inside a recreation area with his friends, including Forrest, who is very impressed that Buffy told Professor Walsh off, but Riley claims Buffy's nuts. Parker comes down the stairs, and Forrest asks him about Buffy. Parker says she's all right, but kind of clingy. When Forrest asks, though, he says she's definitely great in the sack. The word is stamina. But he goes on to say something awful that I don't want to repeat, but you kind of need to hear the words to understand Riley's reaction. Parker says the difference between a freshman girl and a toilet seat, the toilet seat doesn't follow you around after you use it. Riley punches him, which is my favorite Riley moment ever. We then cut to outside. Riley tells Forrest and Graham he can't believe he did that. Forrest points out that Parker has said much grosser things than that. And Riley says, what is it? And goes on, I just didn't like hearing him talk about Buffy that way. I think that, well, I guess I like her. And they tell him that everyone already knew that. And Forrest says, she's peculiar. A giveaway, buddy. I never quite got that. I I guess there is something I am missing. The whole peculiar thing never really worked for me, and it is going to come back. They ask Riley what he's going to do now, and he says, go see a girl. So we are right around 25% through the episode, and here I look for the first major plot turn. I think of it as the one-quarter twist. It should come from outside the protagonist, spin the story in a new direction, and raise the stakes. And sometimes in a TV episode, as opposed to a novel or movie, it will come closer to one third through. I am not sure if we have one here because I am still not sure what the main plot is. If it is Riley's interest in Buffy, this scene does fit the bill. Parker comes from outside of Riley because Forrest draws him into the conversation. Then he says something so gross, Riley punches him, and it leads to this realization that will now spin the story in a new direction, and it raises the emotional stakes for Riley. Now, we've also spent time on the military guys and Spike and also have something of a turn for that plot. At 12 minutes, 16 seconds in, we're back in Spike's point of view. He's lying on the floor and looks like he's passed out. 
Guys in white coats drag him out and put him on a gurney. Spike's eyes open and he grabs the closest white coat by the neck and says, sorry, can't stay. Gotta go see a girl. And this echoes Riley's words. I love the reflection there. And we cut to a commercial. So it is also a great hook. At 12 minutes, 50 seconds, we return to Spike. He fights with the white coats. At one point, he howls in pain, seemingly for no reason. The other vampire is yelling at Spike to let him out. He claims he knows where the exit is, and without him, Spike will be lost. Spike spins another white-coated guy around and throws him, goes into vamp face, and flips the guy over and gets out the white coat's key card to open the cage for the other vampire. That vampire leads him out. It's a pretty fun action sequence. They run, they dodge, they dive under this metal door that is whooshing down and just make it in time. A bunch of military guys come down the elevator and Spike says, new plan, we split up. And he throws the other vampire at the military guys and says, you go that way. Spike goes the other way, diving under another door that is coming down. At 13 minutes, 54 seconds in, Willow, very sad, is lying on her bed. She has sad music playing. Someone knocks on the door. She says, come in, and it's Riley. And this scene is, I think, mainly from Willow's point of view, though you could also see it as Riley's. And he says, gee, I hope I'm not interrupting anything really depressing. He tells her he was thinking of asking Buffy out, and he wants Willow to tell him more about Buffy. Willow goes into a monologue. She says, let's say she helps him. And he and Buffy go out, and they get closer and fall in love. And time stops, and they start to feel the world is made for them alone. And she continues, until the day one of you leaves and rips the still-beating heart from the other, who's now a broken, hollow mockery of the human condition. Willow folds her arms, stares straight ahead, and Riley says, yep, that's the plan. And Willow responds, I figured it was. He says he understands if she wants to tell him to go to hell, but he's never courted anyone like Buffy before. And when Willow asks why she should trust him, he hopes she'll think he has an honest face. But Willow says, I've seen honest faces before. They usually come attached to liars. Riley, with good grace, says he can't win here. He understands. He'll go. And he appreciates her wanting to protect Buffy. He guesses she kind of brings that out in people. As he's almost to the door, Willow tells him that Buffy likes cheese and tells him about her stuffed piggy named Mr. Gordo and that Buffy loves ice capades without the irony and that she's dragging Willow to a party at Lowell House that night. That is Riley's house, so he'll be there. He asks if Buffy ever talks about him, but Willow says, sorry. Still, Riley feels like he has a fighting chance with his new accomplice. And Willow says, I'm not your accomplice. Riley says, no, no, of course not. Willow responds, I'm not. Riley says, you're not. Willow says, we're clear. And Riley answers, we're clear. Now we switch to another young woman, though this one is a vampire, in her room with music playing. It is Harmony, and she looks thrilled when Spike comes in, but then she slaps him in the face and calls him a bastard and says, you dumped me and staked me and hurt me and left me. He tells her she's forgetting what else he did. He missed her. They start to embrace. She's glad he's back, and this time it's for good, right? He says, yes, they'll do whatever she wants, go wherever she wants, kill whoever she wants, starting with the Slayer. But Harmony wants him to leave the Slayer alone. Buffy will only slap him around, and Harmony can do that, and she pushes him onto the bed. At 19 minutes, 6 seconds in, we get a quick scene from Xander's point of view in the forest. He is talking about how every man faces this moment, waiting for the unseen enemy, and Giles tells him to shut up. Now we are at the party at Lowell House. Willow doesn't look too thrilled, and Buffy says they can go if she's not having a good time, but Willow says no, she'll go get a soda, and she sneaks away and talks to Riley as they stand back to back, as if they are not speaking to each other. Willow tells him Buffy's wearing a halter top but sensible shoes, so that means dancing, light conversation, but Riley can't dance. 
So Willow tells him, go talk to Buffy. And then I love this part. She says, and remember, if you hurt her, I will beat you to death with the shovel. A vague disclaimer is nobody's friend. Have fun. I have quoted that disclaimer line so often. This week, we have some listener comments. The first one is about Beer Bad from Roberta Lip, host of the Amazing Mad Men podcast, They Coined It. And she said, learning that this episode was some kind of attempt to be a PSA elucidates its weaknesses. It drags in part because they go back for a second night of drinking. Why? Because Beer Bad. Stay in school, kids. And she also said, but you were also right. It was a bad metaphor. It never works as a metaphor. I never got that it was supposed to be a metaphor. To me, it was frat guys bad. Beer is fine if it's not cursed. And I uh, do agree with Roberta. That last part is really what the episode ends up saying. Frat guys are bad. Beer is okay, unless a warlock told the bartender how to curse it. There is one more listener comment from Raven Dark Author, but it falls a bit into the spoiler category, so I will talk about it at the end. Now we're in Riley's point of view. He makes his way to Buffy, smiles. He acts like he is about to ask her out, but at the last minute, instead, he asks if she did the chapter nine reading. Some theories, huh? And he offers her a piece of cheese. We are nearing the midpoint of the episode. Typically, we'll see here either the protagonist suffer a major reversal or the protagonist makes a commitment to the quest. To figure out if there is either one here, we need to know who is the protagonist. And the factors for a good protagonist are that should be the main point of view character who has a goal the protagonist actively pursues and has the most at stake point of view has been a mix of Riley and Spike, but also Willow, Harmony, Buffy, and Xander, and a little bit of Giles in there. Now, that's not unusual to have a number of scenes from different points of view in this type of episode, but I do find it a little difficult here that we do so much jumping around. In the end, I think we have the most of Riley's point of view. So let's move on to a goal that the protagonist actively pursues. Buffy doesn't have any goal in this episode. She's mainly reacting to things. She wants to help Willow. So that's a goal, but it is not a driving force in every scene. Riley's first goal is to grade his papers. Soon after that, though it's on an unconscious level, it might be to figure out his feelings for Buffy. And then from that plot turn where he punched Parker, he did have an active goal, which was to ask Buffy out to connect with her. Spike, in contrast, had an active goal from the very beginning, almost as soon as he woke up. He had two of them, get out of the initiative and go after Buffy. So he is the one with the most active goal. Willow, Xander, and Giles have uh, goals that are more about dealing with where they are in life and their emotional issues. And so those can power subplots or, in this case, character arcs that will go through a number of episodes. So we're down to Riley and Spike. And so the question is, who has the most at stake? Riley has the most at stake emotionally once he realizes his feelings for Buffy. Spike, though, has the most at stake in a physical sense. The military guys want to experiment on him, or they already have. They want to keep him in captivity. So he is risking captivity. He's risking Buffy killing him when he confronts her. He's risking the military people or the doctors killing him. So this is why I struggle with who is the protagonist and what is the main plot here. And for the most part to this point, this episode feels to me like two fairly strong subplots and some minor subplots and no main story. At 21 minutes, 27 seconds in, 
Xander sees Harmony pouring gas from a gas can on a bunch of things in a wooded area. Xander holds up a stake and says, I'm warning you, I've been highly trained to put this through your heart. No mercy, no warning. Which is funny since he just gave her a warning. Harmony says, I can kill you where you stand. Xander says, bring it on then. But the two of them are not terribly good at fighting. She slaps him. He kicks her shin. She calls him a sissy kicker. They get a hold of each other, but neither one can really prevail, though Harmony says she is so going to bite you. And they finally decide both will stop on account of three and let go, and they do. Xander says it's been great catching up with her, and he'll leave her to her fire, just noticing what she's been doing. And Harmony says it's not her fire. There must be a CD in there because she says the sex pistols? Ew, this crap belongs to Spike. She goes on about how Spike came back with all these big promises. Not that she believed them, but he could have at least spent one night with her. But no, everything was Slayer this and Slayer that. Xander is looking more and more nervous as she continues. And she says Spike probably already killed the Slayer. Harmony's not taking him back, but she says, I just want to know why it is that men always... She lights her match, looks around, and sees that Xander disappeared. And she sighs and finishes leave. She walks off in disgust, throwing the lit match behind her on the pile, and it flares. At 23 minutes 42 seconds, we cut back to the party. Buffy is dancing, but not with Riley, with a couple other guys. In a moment, we'll see Riley dejected sitting with Willow. So back to what is the midpoint. We didn't really have a midpoint reversal for Spike. Yes, Xander found out Spike was there, but that doesn't change much. Spike is still going to do what he is going to do. And while this means Buffy may hear that he's back, I don't think Spike is really worried about that. Ditching Harmony to go after Buffy, it's a little bit of a commitment, but it is mostly Spike continuing on the path that he was already on before he went to see Harmony. Riley did suffer a reversal when he tried to talk to Buffy. So this adds to the idea that the Riley pursuing Buffy plot is the main plot. And now he's sitting with Willow saying he can't believe he choked. He doesn't understand. He's good at things. He works hard. He gets things done. And Willow says, well, you failed extremely well. One other Doug Petrie comment I'll throw in now. He said the chemistry was so good between the actors playing Riley and Willow that they had to be careful that the fans didn't think that this was all meant to start a Riley-Willow relationship. And that never crossed my mind, but I can see that because they are pretty fun together in this episode. A song that Oz's band used to play comes on to the stereo. Riley notices that Willow looks sad and he tells the guy who is choosing the music to put something else on. Willow tells him go find Buffy. She wants to go home, tell Buffy not to worry, which at least will give him something to say to her. Riley finds Buffy, and she seems to appreciate his concern for Willow. He says he wanted to ask her something, and Buffy says, ask away. But Xander rushes in, clearly worried. He sees Riley, so he doesn't say anything about Spike, just says he needs to talk. It's something about unfinished business. And Buffy leaves with him. Forrest, who has walked up behind Riley, says, denied. And Riley says, it's not like she blew me off. She just left with another guy. So Forrest tells him he's needed downstairs anyway. Along with Graham, they walk to a floor-to-ceiling mirror. Forrest says, you know, I hate to say it, but they're probably on their way to make crazy naked sex. As they talk, there's a retinal scan. Graham says he likes Buffy, he's on Riley's side, and that mirrored wall opens up to an elevator. Inside, Riley enters a voice-activated code, and the computer responds, Special Agent Riley Finn. As they ride the elevator, Riley says his trouble is what girl will go out with someone who's all regular guy by day and demon hunter by night. Graham comments maybe a peculiar one. 
So lots of good exposition here through minor conflict. At 27 minutes, 22 seconds in, we are in this huge underground area. There are lots of guys in military gear, lots of people in white lab coats. We also see demons and vampires on gurneys and people in scrubs rushing around. I am not sure what I thought when I first saw this episode. This is a pretty big reveal that Riley is one of these commando guys. At 27 minutes, 44 seconds in, we get the next big reveal, which is that they are reporting to Professor Walsh. She wears a white lab coat. She tells them there is a code red, Hostile 17 escaped, and we cut to a commercial. When we return, Walsh continues briefing them and says that a failure to capture Hostile 17 could mean everything they've worked for, the initiative itself, could end tonight. That is the first time we hear the term the initiative. Riley says nobody's failing on my watch, so now we know that he is also in charge. In the next scene, Riley, Graham, and Forrest, now in their military gear, Exit from what looks like a giant crypt in a wooded area. We cut to Buffy saying, what's wrong with him? She's talking about Spike, and she says, doesn't he get it? It's her town, and it's her night off. She's at Giles' apartment with him and Xander, and Xander says, well, he's sure Spike would have picked another night if he knew she was busy with Teutonic boy toy. So a little reappearance of Xander's jealousy. Buffy says Riley is a doof, but he's not Teutonic. I don't know what Teutonic means, so I looked it up, and it didn't really help me understand this. Merriam-Webster says it means thought to be typical of the German people relating to Germany or to the German language. Dictionary.com for Teutonic Order said a religious military order founded in 1190 in the Holy Land by German crusaders that originally did charitable work, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if the writers knew that, but the relation to a religious military order and crusaders does kind of fit what we have seen about the initiative. Buffy says uh, she needs to go alone and kill Spike. She's going to hang out in popular places, lure him away somewhere more deserted, and kill him. Xander insists she take a flare gun in case she gets into trouble and he and Giles will come. We cut to Spike in a computer lab and he finds Buffy's residence hall and says, hello gorgeous. Riley and his friends are creeping through foliage, and they see a civilian, Buffy, sitting alone on a bench. They're watching from afar through binoculars. Graham says she's compromising the area, and Forrest is kind of funny. He says, at least she's not making crazy naked sex, and Riley says, told you. Riley wants to get her out of there, but Forrest says, hold on. What could a hostel want to eat more than her after an initiative diet? And Riley says, you want to use the girl I have a crush on as bait? But Forrest makes the point that they can shoot the hostel from 50 yards away, so it's not a risk, but Riley is not willing to chance it. We are now approaching three quarters through the episode. Usually there we see the last major plot turn, which unlike that first turn, should not come from outside the protagonist, but instead should grow from the midpoint, either the commitment or the reversal, and take the plot in yet another new direction. It's a little bit hard to pin down here. If our midpoint was Riley's failed attempt with Buffy to ask her out, nothing really grows out of that that spins the story. If our main plot is about Spike, we are going to see the story spin for him, not in this scene, but in the next one, really dramatically. But that is quite a bit later than three quarters through. If you are following a four-act structure, that probably sets off the last 
act because it does take the story in a completely new way. So let's let's see what happens next. At 32 minutes, nine seconds in, Riley has changed back into civilian clothes and he approaches Buffy, who is sitting alone on a bench. We have dramatic irony here because the audience knows both of their secrets, but they are unaware of the other's secret. When Buffy asks what Riley's doing there, he says he didn't have a chance to say goodbye to her at the party, which she left with a friend who is a boy. And Buffy starts to say that Xander's not, but she must decide that it'll be easier to get rid of Riley if she puts him off. So she says not anyone she wants to talk about. She keeps trying to get rid of him. She tells him she needs time alone. She needs space. Riley says we're outdoors. Buffy says emotionally. I mean emotionally. He offers to walk her back to her room to help her. Buffy says she doesn't need help. They argue about him thinking boys can take care of themselves and girls need help, which she says is so Teutonic. They both vow to stay out there until they hear a scream and then both say see ya and run in opposite directions. At 33 minutes, 30 seconds in, we get a quick scene of Riley and the other guys following a beeping signal and radioing each other. So the initiative, I am not sure if it is purposeful or not. They don't impress me a huge amount because they have all this equipment and all this communication and high tech, and yet it doesn't seem to do a whole lot for them. It, it just feels like they ought to be better at this. Now we get to a major turn. At 33 minutes, 50 seconds in, Willow again is in her room on her bed looking sad, listening to sad music. There's a knock on the door and she says, come in. But this time it's not Riley, it's Spike. So I think that earlier scene with Riley was there to help the audience kind of gloss over the idea that Willow, who knows all about vampires and that they can't come in unless you invite them, just says, come in, not knowing who is knocking on the door. Because she's sad, because she's not thinking about it, and last time it was Riley. She sees Spike, jumps to her feet, asks what he wants, very nervous, says, a spell? I can do that. Referring back to Lover's Walk when Spike held her hostage and wanted her help to do a spell to get Drew back. But Spike stalks around the room. She tries to run. He grabs her and throws her. He tells her he'll give her a choice. He'll kill her, but he can let her stay dead or bring her back to be like him. And he goes into vamp face. Willow says, I'll scream. And Spike says, bonus. He turns up the music, throws her on the bed and climbs on top of her and bends to bite her neck. Willow screams and it's very eerie. We pan to the hallway in the dorm and because of the music, there are all these people out there, but no one can hear Willow. And we cut to a commercial, a great hook. I do wonder, is this the scream that Riley and Buffy heard? If so, the timing feels off. I understand you can't show everything simultaneously, But that makes it take a really long time for either one of them to do anything or get to Willow. At 35 minutes in, we return to Willow's room, but now there's a twist. Willow is lying on the bed. At first, it looks like maybe she is dead, but we see she's breathing. Um, She's okay. And Spike is sitting toward the foot of the bed, kind of his elbows on his knees, his head hanging, looking dejected. And he says, I don't understand. This sort of thing's never happened. And Willow says, maybe you were nervous. Spike says, I felt all right when we started. Let's try again. He vamps out, lunges at her to bite, but starts screaming in pain as Willow cringes. He tries another time and the same thing happens. This is a fantastic way to show what happened after he tried to bite her. And it gets the viewer quickly up to speed. It also makes clear that there is some issue here, that Spike is having terrible pain when he tries to hurt Willow. In the escape scene from the initiative, it didn't happen all the time when he was trying to hurt the initiative guys. So now we know this is going on. This is a huge spin. Spike is angry. He's hitting things. He's pacing. Willow, breathing hard, says maybe he's trying too hard. Doesn't this happen to every vampire?
If you know someone who loves Buffy the Vampire Slayer but doesn't listen to podcasts, or if you would simply like to revisit season one of Buffy in writing rather than re-listening to the podcast, you can get Buffy in the Art of Story season one, writing better fiction by watching Buffy in print or in ebook editions. I also have available the first part of season two in book form. Each of the episodes is included and there is all the content from the podcast just edited to be a little more polished and shinier so you can relive the episodes that way. If you are a storyteller, the books also include topics at the beginning of each episode so that you can flip to the ones that you might find most helpful if, for instance, you want to read all the things about subplots or everything about character arcs. And there are questions at the end of each episode to guide you in applying what you learned from it to your own writing. You can find those Buffy in the Art of Story books at lisalilly.com slash Buffy books or search on your favorite ebook or print book retailer. We're going to continue with this metaphor to impotence. I feel like the humor works because I believe that Willow at first might try to make Spike feel better because of that past situation where he held her captive. And part of the way she survived until someone came to rescue her and Xander was by appeasing Spike, by sympathizing with him. So it seems natural to me that Willow might default to that while she is unconsciously or consciously grappling with what to do next. Even though Spike has tried to bite her and it didn't work, he is so powerful and has been such a threat that it fits. And I mention that because humor generally works best when it is based on both painful emotions and on truth. It doesn't work if you're stepping back and saying, wait, that character wouldn't do that. Back to Spike and Willow, Willow says maybe he's trying too hard. Doesn't this happen to every vampire? And Spike says... Not to me it doesn't. We go now really to the emotional pain Willow has been struggling with. Willow says, it's me, isn't it? He responds, what are you talking about? And Willow says, well, you came looking for Buffy, then settled. You didn't want to bite me. I just happened to be around. And Spike says, piffle. Willow goes on that she knows she's not the kind of girl vamps like to sink their teeth into. It's always that she's like a sister or such a good friend. There is a troubling aspect because if we see the previous scene, I think there is a very strong parallel to rape there, a, a metaphor when Spike is lunging at Willow, he's biting her or about to bite her, and we pan out and no one else hears it. There's people around. No one is helping her. If we carry that into this scene, then it becomes a very troubling metaphor with this idea, as we'll go on, that somehow women or any victim wanted to be assaulted or attacked. I don't think that was the intent of the metaphor here, and I didn't read it that way. But if you did, this scene would would be troubling and, and disturbing. Part of why this works is because we have built this from the beginning of season one, this part of Willow's character. In season one and two, Willow had such a crush on Xander and he saw her as a buddy. Now Oz has left and that really has nothing to do with Willow, but it would be very hard for her not to take that personally. And then just today, Riley knocked on her door and while I don't get any sense that Willow has a crush on Riley, all the same, he came and talked to her, but he was really looking for Buffy and ended up talking to Willow instead. And now now Spike is here and he came looking for Buffy. 
also, this scene is a great metaphor for when you are stuck in sadness and grief, it is so hard to see anything else. And Willow, when she ought to be fearing for her life and trying to figure out how to get out of here, is kind of mired in this, it's me, this this awful feeling she has. And the reason that works for me, one, it is a good metaphor, but also she she does come to and take action. If we didn't have her do that, I would not like that aspect of the metaphor. Finally, I also like that Spike reassures Willow. He recognizes her pain and he tries to speak to it, which is pretty amazing because he was just going to kill her, though he did offer to make her like him. And he says to her, don't be ridiculous. I'd bite you in a heartbeat. And he also offers specifics here. So we know he is not just saying this to make Willow feel better. He means it. He says, don't be ridiculous. I'd bite you in a heartbeat. Willow says, really? And he says, thought about it. She asks when, and he says, remember last year you had on that uh, fuzzy pink number with the lilac underneath? She tells him she never would have guessed. He says he hates being obvious. It takes the mystery out of it. And she says, but if you could, and Spike says, if I could, yeah. Willow now tells him this doesn't make him any less terrifying, but he tells her not to patronize him. This reminds us that Willow felt for Spike in Lover's Walk, despite that he was terrorizing her. And a lot of it is because Spike has such deep emotions and he wears his heart on his sleeve. So despite being a vampire and very fearsome, he is also very human. We now cut to outside. Graham is clocking the different bodies inside the dorm with some sort of heat signature reading gone. And he realizes by body temperature that there is a vampire in one of the rooms. We now cut to Spike, who's saying he's only 120 six. How could this be happening? And Willow tells him, why don't we wait a half an hour and try again? Spike shakes his head, not looking at her, and Willow's expression changes as she realizes, what am I doing? And she says, or, and she grabs a lamp, smashes it on his head, and runs. Now we are going to the climax, where our opposing forces have their final clash and the conflict resolves. It's dramatic, it's action-oriented, but it continues the kind of fuzziness of what's the main plot because if the main plot is sort of the rom-com of Buffy and Riley, yes, they're going to come face-to-face for a little bit, but it won't resolve anything. If it is Spike, then yes, he and the military guys come face to face, and he prevails in the sense that he escapes. So Willow is struggling with the door, which is locked. All the outside halls have gone dark, and and, and the dorm room has gone dark. And we switch to Riley's point of view, looking through night vision goggles. The military guys run up the stairs, down the hall, and they use a battering ram to break the door open. So I guess Willow must have moved away from it. Good for her. And she now runs into those guys as the door after the door opens and she gets out in the hall. Someone, I guess, realizes she is a civilian and yells, hold your fire. And Spike throws one of the initiative guys to the side. And I don't see him suffering any pain from that, but he grabs another one, starts to hurt him. And now Spike does howl in pain. They get a hood over his head, zip ties around his wrists, but he gets free as they are arguing about whether to take Willow in. Riley says, no, I'm not clear if he recognizes it's her. But the others are worried that this human could have been changed. Spike, who has gotten free, grabs a fire extinguisher and bashes one of the military guys with it and, again, doesn't seem to suffer any pain from it. One of them shoots at him. He blocks it with the fire extinguisher and fog or mist or gas from that extinguisher goes all over the hall, making it very foggy and smoky. Just as another initiative guy is saying they need to contain the scene and looking like he's about to club Willow, Buffy appears and says, contain this, and she fires the flare gun. It's dark. We can see that it's her. I'm not sure why none of the guys recognize her. Perhaps they're not expecting her. Mostly we just have to kind of willingly suspend our 
our disbelief. We need as the audience to be able to see well enough to know it's Buffy, but we have to assume that they cannot see well. There are flashes all over. There's lots of confusion and smoke. Buffy fights some of the guys. Spike runs off during the chaos, dives out a window, does a wonderful forward roll on the ground and gets away. A few of the military guys chase him and watch him go. Riley, in the meantime, is fighting Buffy, who flips him over. And as he gets to his feet, he yells abort at 40 minutes, 30 seconds in. Now we are at the falling action, where we tie up loose ends and resolve subplots. We switch back to the initiative. Professor Walsh is not happy. She has read their reports, and she says, So Hostel 17 has an accomplice who's smart, aggressive, and somehow escapes description. And the guys say whoever it was, he was big and strong, which is really fun and funny. They couldn't see Buffy very well. Buffy is pretty small compared to them, but of course, it must have been a big, strong guy. Riley says at least Hostile 17 can't harm a living creature without intense neurological pain. He can't feed. He can't hardly hit anymore. I will take Riley's word for it, but I do not think that's what we've seen. Spike definitely hit some of these guys pretty hard without any pain. We cut to a sunny day. Riley wanders the campus and sees Buffy. He apologizes for the night before, and Buffy does too. Riley asks about Willow, and Buffy mentions the fraternity prank on her dorm the night before. And Buffy says he wanted to tell her something at the party, and Riley says, oh yeah, very important stuff. I don't remember any of it now, but you would have been fascinated, possibly even moved. Did Willow tell you I like cheese? And Buffy says, you're a little peculiar. Riley responds, I can live with that. And that is the end of the episode, this return of peculiar, which still does not work for me. Which is a great segue into the DVD commentary by Doug Petrie, the writer. He said Peculiar was the biggest giveaway of romantic comedies ever. So I guess that I don't watch enough rom-coms. If you do and, and this whole Peculiar thing work for you, I would love to hear that. Petrie also said the big question for this episode is what is Riley really that we're going to find out his secret and that the original title was Secret Agent Man rather than the initiative, but they thought it was too obvious. So this tells me that that was the main plot. I'm not sure if the writers saw that as part of the sort of Buffy Riley rom-com or separate. It pinpoints my difficulty with the episode. It's more of a reveal about Riley and less of a plot because neither Riley nor Buffy had a goal in this episode to find out more about Riley. It doesn't feel like a story in itself. Petrie commented that Buffy had always been dark and supernatural, and it's not an accident that the initiative is white tile and so bright. It was their first foray into science fiction, and he said they'd never seen Buffy as a show look this sterile before. On the Spike plot, Doug Petrie said he was worried about that escape scene from the initiative that Spike seemed too heroic, and he thought that that was wrong. And Jane Espenson said, no, he should be heroic in this scene. And Joss Whedon agreed and said, yes, Spike is the hero in that scene. He's a James Bond type character. Petrie commented that Spike was supposed to have searing pain whenever he hit someone, and that was the first time we saw it, and he noted that they had a punch in the scene where it didn't hurt Spike but should have. He also commented that the scene with Xander struggling with the weapons was because the writers realized they had to deal with this backstory. That two Halloweens ago, Xander became a commando, and he had gained some skills and ability and knowledge. And they needed to decide, did he still have those skills? And they thought that, no, he probably wouldn't. After two years, the spell would have worn off. 
Petrie also said he loved that they could do so many genres in Buffy, that Buffy was not a romantic comedy or sci-fi or coming of age or a secret agent show or soap opera or horror. Instead, it drew on all of those at different times and sometimes the same time. That Willow and Spike scene, there was a rumor on the internet that Willow was going to be killed. So the Spike scene where Spike lunges and bites Willow, they played it out and gave it a lot of space and went very dark to play with the audience who might really think that Willow had been killed. And they decided on the scene by asking, well, if we were going to kill Willow, how would we do it? He also commented on the rape metaphor in that scene, that it was very disturbing and horrible. And then there's that cut to the commercial. And when they come back, he saw that as a new scene with a new and different metaphor to sexual dysfunction, which was funny. So the breaking of the scene is what made that work for him. There are a few more things I want to share from his commentary, but they fit better in foreshadowing and spoilers. Before we get to that, my overall take on this episode is that unlike earlier seasons where every episode told its own clear story and then many of them also moved the season story arc, this episode feels like an in-between one. It connects different parts of the season. It lets the audience know about Riley's secret. It inches Riley's interest in Buffy along, but it doesn't have a complete story of its own that interests me. The closest is Spike's story, but I feel like we're left in the middle of that because he is now in this new spot of being unable to harm anyone. So that, other than foreshadowing, is it for this episode. I hope you will stay tuned for the foreshadowing and spoilers. If you are not sticking around, thank you so much for listening. And a special thank you to patrons who support the show. I hope you will all I'll come back next Monday for Pangs, the only Thanksgiving episode in the run of Buffy. And we are back for spoilers. First, that comment I mentioned from Raven Dark Author on YouTube on the episode School Hard. Great episode of the podcast here. Wanted to quickly make a point, though. You mentioned that the whole thing about Angel being Spike's sire is retconned later. I assume you're saying that because it's later revealed that Drew is Spike's sire, which we see in Fool for Love, season five. And Raven Dark goes on to say, based on what I've read about the series and heard the writers say about the show, I'm pretty sure that's not a retcon. The word sire, at least in this show's lore, refers to the vampire line. So Angel sired Drew, then Drew in turn sired Spike. This means that Angel and Spike are part of the same sire line, which means that both Angel and Drew are Spike sires because Angel is the first in the line. Both are correct from the start. I found this really interesting because in my head, that's how I justified it to myself. I didn't know that the writers had said that. It does fit a bit with some things in Angel, where Drew will eventually refer to Darla, I'm pretty sure, as Grandmama, because we will find out, I think we already found out, Darla sired Angel, who sired Drew, who sired Spike. Thank you, Raven Dark author, for sharing that. Going on to Doug Petrie's commentary, he said he really liked writing for Riley because Riley started as a cornbread Iowa square and just gets darker and darker as his world gets darker and Riley realizes the government he works for is dirty and he has to question his own team and whether the initiative is getting into its own Vietnam. I had not before linked Riley's darkness with his disillusionment over the initiative. Maybe I'll see that more as I go forward and break down the episodes. Regarding theme, Petrie said that season four is all about science versus magic. The Scooby gang are magic and the initiative is science. And that, I think, is, is pretty clear. 
What I found most interesting is Petrie said the initiative guys look like they have their act together and the Scoobies in this season will look like they're falling apart. And in fact, they will fall apart, but they will prevail. Maybe that was the writer's motive behind breaking up the Scooby gang. He also said that season four, I'm not sure if he meant season four or just this episode, was almost like taking a field trip to another TV show, which highlights perhaps a contrast between the writer's view where I can see where it would be really fun to do that and how many viewers felt they didn't love taking that field trip to a different show, to a more sci-fi like show. Or in my case, I don't mind the sci-fi elements, but to a show that in this season feels too much to me, like Buffy Goes to College, with less metaphor. Last Petrie comment, Petrie commented that even at the end, Riley is starting to break away from the others in the initiative, and that they are planting the idea that the initiative is in over its head here. And he comments on the seeds for season four. I see that as very connected to my takeaway from the episode, which is that it is less its own story and more about planting these seeds for season four. I'm assuming he would disagree with me, though, about the, the plot and subplot not being clear enough or not having enough there. And I would love to hear your take on it. If you would like to join in and chime in, please do so on uh, Twitter at Lisa M. Lilly or Buffy and the Art of Stories Facebook page or on YouTube or on my website where the episodes are posted, lisalilly.com slash Buffy Story. A few more foreshadowings for me. I really enjoyed Forrest at first in this episode. I like that he encourages Riley to admit his feelings for Buffy and to have fun. And he makes fun of Riley, but it's funny, not mean. Later, he does start getting an edge, basically telling Riley she's not worth it. Don't waste his time. And then he wants to use Buffy as bait. And while I feel like that is justified in this episode, it does give us hints of what is to come, where Forrest will resent Buffy, feel that Buffy is taking Riley away from him and from the initiative, which in a way is true. Based on what Petrie said, Forrest is right. Riley really cannot both be the initiative guy, the secret agent guy, and be so immersed in Buffy's world. Inevitably, those will conflict. A little fun foreshadowing in the beginning when Buffy says to Giles about the drawing, that's your man, and Giles says, your man, actually. So a nice, fun foreshadow that Riley will turn out to be, in a way, Buffy's man because they will become involved. Riley's comment on Buffy bringing out the protectiveness in people, is that true? I don't know. I have to think about that going forward, but it definitely foreshadows some of the problems with their relationship. On a physical level, I think Riley reads as claiming that he likes how strong Buffy is. At the same time, I think he struggles with her being stronger than him physically and when we get to season five, when Joyce is ill and when Joyce is dying, Riley wants to protect Buffy and he wants her to lean on him emotionally. And she instead is leaning on him for practical things like, can you go pick up Dawn? And her way of coping is to keep things together, at least outwardly, emotionally. She doesn't feel like she can let go and lean on Riley or anyone emotionally, or she will fall apart. And Riley really needs her to do that. Now, that's my read on it, and I'll talk more about that later. Not everyone would see it that way. I don't think the writer saw it that way. But to me, this is a foreshadowing of that, that Riley needs to play the protector and that creates some conflict in his relationship with Buffy. Walsh saying that failing to capture Hostel 17 could mean everything they work for could end tonight 
So it's a really dramatic line, but it is never justified. They don't capture Hostel 17, and nothing really happens to the initiative because of it. Yeah, Spike plays an important role in season four, and I suppose you can argue that, yes, it causes some extra trouble for the initiative that they don't capture him, but I don't I don't really think it makes that much difference. And this, to me, is a foreshadowing of the issues with the initiative itself. There's all this buildup, but overall, the initiative doesn't end up feeling very powerful. The biggest foreshadowing and the one I will end with, and also the saddest, is when Willow talks about everything's wonderful until the day one of you leaves and rips out the still beating heart of the other and Riley jokes that's the plan. Riley will leave Buffy in a way that parallels Oz leaving Willow. It will be suddenly, it will be on a moment's notice, it will take Buffy by surprise. And it will relate to this dark side that Riley has that Buffy was unaware of in the same way that Willow knew about Oz's side, his wolf side, and so did he, but neither of them quite grasped what that meant. So on that happy note, thank you again for listening. I hope you will come back next Monday for Pangs, where Spike needs help, Angel lurks, and the gang struggles with Thanksgiving narratives. If you enjoyed this episode of Buffy and the Art of Story, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts or share the episode with a friend. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC, copyright 2021. All rights reserved. 